by yourself because you're so agile. What? 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 <laughs> you're so annoyed that you're alone. I, I get it. I get it. I'm Brandon Berry. This is Raising Roots Farm. We're in Hickory, North Carolina. Trying to make something out of nothing, you know He never wanted silver, gold, or the finer things Just a wife and kids, a home in the American dream Whoa, how you gonna step in line? Uh, we are predominantly are a hog farm, but we raise cows, um, we have laying hens, and we've got a 9,000 square foot greenhouse where we grow uh, produce for really our own butcher shop as ingredients, pre-made salads, that sort of thing. I want to see the world from the edge of my sea. A big windshield or a plane, not a TV screen. Don't you need the road to tell you who you really are? Find out whether or not a man could ever change his stars. Oh, how you gonna step in line? We're a family owned and operated farm and the family, each time we make a decision on a part of the farm, we kind of do that together and decide, you know, how we're going to manage that and, and who's going to be responsible for it and, and how that's going to fit with sort of the family's routines. And, and that's how we've navigated each aspect of the business with, with the family unit. changes stars so we started um, in the backyard of our home across town and created a small little greenhouse there uh, that was aquaponics focused and um, it was on the north side of the building which is not a favorable place to grow food you don't have a lot of sunlight and so through those challenges, uh, we kind of learned a lot of different agricultural practices. And in doing that, we found that we enjoyed working together and learning together. And that has kind of compelled us to take the leap out of the backyard and into the commercial side. Um, but this is, this is the nursery. So these, these plants are dead. <laughs> Oh yeah. So Jennifer and I uh, kind of undertook this greenhouse not having a clue what we were doing. Uh, we knew that we wanted to grow in some kind of greenhouse structure and kind of strive for year-round production. We didn't know how big of a greenhouse we really wanted, how big of a greenhouse we really needed. This is kind of the, the, main, the main greenhouse. We, we built this, just her and I. Uh, never done anything like this in our life. It took us a while to get this. What's a while? Oh. <laughs> Funny, funny thing is we found a 17,000 foot greenhouse on Craigslist for just an insanely inexpensive deal. What we didn't know is that it was a good deal because it sat in salvage for 20 years, uh, or as a 20 year old structure and it sat in salvage for a couple years and just started to rust. The structure was fine, but we ended up going down, down to South Carolina and cutting every bolt off that thing and hauling it back up here to Hickory. That took us about three months just to, just to get the thing down on the ground in a truck and, and back to the farm. Uh, building it 
is like building a giant erector set. I mean, it's, it, it's nothing like anything we've built before. Uh, usually when we build with lumber and something doesn't quite line up, we can manage that with just trimming here and cutting there. But this thing had to be put back together with great precision. Uh, even though I've got engineering in my, in my background, building greenhouses isn't on that list. We worked with a manufacturer to kind of put everything back together. So they created a new uh, skew for us just for these anchors. Because we had to cut all these off at the base of the old structure. And we oh, yeah. had to cut every bolt off the thing. So they, they engineered those for us. And then they would help get us the parts uh, if they had them. And if they didn't have them, they were nice enough to recreate them and resurrect them, which was really cool. So it took us about two years just to get the structure where it could even be covered in plastic and then about another year and a half just dealing with building the inside and, and wiring it up and getting the plastic on. Uh, the whole thing, you know, I'd say nights, weekends, I was still working a job at the time. It was kind of a save a little, build a little strategy. Uh, but the whole thing went up in about, about four years and then it took us another year to kind of get the aquaponic system going and get that tuned and, and built out and now it's finally in production. Uh, when we, we began to scale the aquaponics system, we, we knew we kind of had to do a little bit more than just produce. Um, there's a lot of risk in scaling aquaponics systems. We weren't sure, you know, we really wanted to kind of anchor the entire income off just that. So we decided to pick produce and a protein. And we thought about cows and goats and sheep. And we, we actually considered doing alpaca and harvesting wool, but weren't exactly confident in, in that market segment so we kept reading and researching and uh, decided on pigs and um, we started with nine on a very small kind of part of the farm that we could afford to clear and uh, began working them on the land and, and quickly became very passionate about pigs and just hooked on their personality and, and of course uh, their meat product is fantastic. I'm a product of my granddad's son Hard working hands and a job well done. <laughs> In a thick and real wool tie. You could see kindness in his eyes. We raise Gloucestershire Old Spots, and they come from the UK predominantly. Uh, they've been in the US for a number of years, and we were attracted to this breed kind of because we're a sucker for a good story. Um, but a few other important aspects as well. Uh, they were nearly extinct from the U.S. and their populations were heavily declined in the U.K. And there's been a number of folks who have not only come to the old spots to help conservation breeding, but many heritage uh, breeds. And we discovered the Livestock Conservancy and what they stood for and, and began looking around at the various breeds that, that are available. We chose the old spots because not only do they have a great story, a very compelling story uh, that we feel a call to action to, but they also are very docile, easy on the land. Uh, I can trust that my kids can be in there with them and not have to worry too much about them. They're not, they're not crazy. Uh, the, they also have um, some of just really unique flavor profile in their meat product. Uh, the old spots were granted what's called a traditional specialty guarantee which attests that their meat product is distinguishable amongst anything else in their class. And it's a minimum of 30 years that they have to provide uh, that meat product and maintain that consistency in order to get that distinction. We, we kind of went all over the place to get this herd. We drove to upstate New York for some, for some uh, genetics. We've gone to Florida, Virginia, and even flown them on airplanes from Oregon, which is where we got kind of our latest UK uh, infusion uh, of genetics. 
Uh, we maintain a healthy amount of U.S. and U.K. pigs on, on the herd or in the herd, and we do so because both genetics are really important. Most of our focus, though, is uh, really on selecting for the best quality of pig. The genetics are important, the numbers around inbreeding is important, but really selecting for a robust pig that has you know, the best body condition that we can find is, is where we try to focus a lot of our um, breeding efforts. Casting shadows, the world's spinning around again. We all know, but we all pretend. Earth spinning around again. So, our farm consists of uh, seven acres originally and we started piecing together additional uh, property onto that farm just a little at a time. And over the course of a couple years, we assembled about 50 acres here uh, of all continuous land that we're developing into pasture uh, and operating the farm on. We also leased 30 acres across town and that 30 acres is dedicated to rotational grazing for our cattle. Uh, and sometimes pigs will, will move through that land uh, our original herd started on seven acres and we've started to kind of move that operation forward by developing an additional wooded paddock and also uh, some grazing land that's come available. So land management's uh, been a big learning curve for us. It's the kind of thing where we absolutely love the regenerative agriculture uh, uh, practices for pigs. It's really hard. <laughs> we've found it very challenging. Uh, pigs love to root and we love to let them be pigs, so we don't ring them, uh, we don't uh, prevent them from doing what they love to do. We try to work with them, uh, so we've used our pigs to kind of clear out various wooded areas. Uh, we've used them to till up, you know, kind of rotten, or not rotten, but rocky land that's, you know, really compacted. Uh, and then we've, we've even made mistakes where they've been on land too long and, and now we've got to go back and fix that. What we really like about the regenerative agriculture world though is that we're not spraying chemicals and, and there's benefits to not doing that, but all of our investments we make in the land return. So even when we don't have enough uh, rain or the pigs stay too long in one spot, we find those pastures bounce back a lot quicker. What we've learned is even though you know, this still isn't perfection and things happen, COVID, uh, before that we had this big drought and we had to park everybody where they were because nothing was growing it was just gross and cr crunchy but what's nice is that even if you have a setback and the land gets kind of taken you know overkilled like like this you're not really because you're not uh, relying on all these chemicals and your biology is still active in that soil it bounces back and every setback is still at least some progress forward uh, it's not like a total wash like we experienced with the chemical approach. yeah so uh, a lot of our land is dedicated to just pigs and we use both wooded areas and um, pastures for their management. We'll, we'll you'll use a lot of uh, uh, cover crops like clover, uh, turnips, brassicas, uh, and various grasses that the pigs like to chew on.
the interesting thing about pasture on pigs is you kind of have to ask yourself, well, well, why? Because the pigs aren't really benefiting from the, the grass that they eat like a cow does. They can't uh, convert grass into a complete protein like a cow. And, and this is a question we get from community a lot. Well, well, why are they out here if you don't need it? All the lights are the nail thin. The secret's almost out. The fires are fizzling. The jury's out and the fall is coming. The, the answer is that they're going to get more micronutrients from the things that they eat than any feed you can give them. Uh, and furthermore, the better we take care of our soil, the more performant that land's going to be for any other kind of livestock that I want to bring in there. Uh, the biodiversity that we see in our healthy pastures is real encouraging. We see a lot of insect life, and that's constantly giving back to uh, our program by accelerating the breakdown of the pig waste that's out in the fields, um, by providing pollinators uh, that we benefit from in our gardens, um, and also, we can tell the difference in our grass-fed animals just in that taste profile, how healthy they are. We aren't running around with needles and, and administering antibiotics, and you know, the, the health of our herd is very strong, and a lot of that's because of their complete nutrition they're getting from the land. So traditional feeds for uh, pigs is typically a corn and soy ration. And the reason for that is that their, their body is very similar to ours in terms of how we process food. And so they need a complete, a complete protein delivered to them, unlike a lot of ruminants that can just survive entirely on grass. So that, that corn and soy ration, though, kind of makes us dependent upon a larger part of the agriculture world that we really don't want to be dependent upon. Nothing wrong with growing corn and soybeans, but would re just rather have something else to feed to our animals. Not only do we believe that our alternative feeds are making them a healthier animal, but it's also very beneficial to us from a financial perspective. The reliance on corn and soy is very expensive, even though it's very efficient feed for pigs and livestock. So our alternative feed program has been a big experiment. We spent a lot of time and energy focusing on things like fodder and mealworm production uh, in order to kind of replace that corn and soy diet. So we hatch them. Oh, look at you, you just came out. So we've got to be sifted again. It's so crazy. And they all start wiggling. This is my kid's favorite thing. So we just put the vegetables in for water. And there's bran in there for their um, food. But yeah. So we're trying to grow enough of them to provide the meal source, the protein source. Oh, here's my good one. These guys will lay eggs, hatch new little worms, and they'll eat these guys once they get ground up. My kids, this is one of their favorite projects, though. Requires some work, and they don't love that part. <laughs> I just find them fascinating. I don't like bugs either, but I just like these guys. I don't know what it is. But they're so fun. I love them. There's probably a gazillion in here. Oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, no, you fell over. It's stuck on the back. You're another newborn. You look it, anyway. Oh, so creepy. That sound is, I mean, it just more into this one. This is one of the transition bins, because you get all the casings of the old, whether when they were worms and they shed them, then they become a larva, which is what I'm looking for. The boys were in, oh, there's one. Oh, that, the white one means he just turned as well. The other one that shed it. Well, it's larva state. Where is the larva? I don't see any in here. Usually they're just these little white, still things. I don't see any. As it turns out, mealworms are about the same nutritional composition as a soybean. And we can grow thousands of them in a small space. It also takes thousands of them to feed a pig. And so it's not exactly a silver bullet and it may not turn out to be cheaper, but we, we believe it's still worth investigating these alternative feeds for a more sustainable agriculture practice that's a bit better for the pig than, than the traditional ration. We've engaged with uh, North Carolina State University, NC State, and there's a researcher there that specializes in alternative feeds, and she's been a big supporter of this program, and we're partnering up to work on either 
mealworm production or fodder or, or whatever, wherever we might take this program uh, so that we can achieve our goal of getting off of that corn and soy ration. We also recycle hundreds of pounds of uh, food waste from the local grocery store. Lowe's Foods, they um, bring, oh, they, oh, this is all their pick and prep stuff, all the stuff that they pre-cut, you know, so people can just buy because they don't want to cut up their own watermelons and all that good stuff. So, on the tops of strawberries, um, and when they take off like the, the brown leaves of their lettuce for display, they'll, um, those leaves will go in the bag. The husk corn, you get all the corn husks. I usually bring those over to the cows, but the pigs don't really love them. Pigs prefer the fruit, all the sugar, of course. But it really helps in the winter when we don't have any pasture for them to really eat the green leaves and stuff. Give them their veggies. Pepper, um, uh, stir fry stuff. Brandon just went in one day and said, hey, do you have like any vegetables, that, stuff that you just throw away? And they're like, yeah. He goes, do you mind if we come and just pick it up every day? And they're like, sure. It was, they didn't really hesitate. And for them it works because their garbage goes by weight. And this is a couple, like I pick up a couple hundred pounds a day of this stuff. Um, summer it's even more because you go all the watermelon rinds. Um, so they're not filling up their dumpsters as fast either. This is why we have to sort it. They can't have that. The pit to the peach. They, they peeled the peaches, but then I guess they saw that they were rotten. So I always pull out the pits to the peach. Here, 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 go. Here, go. With everything we have going on, it's like um, time consuming to get across town and pick it up, do this every day, and plus all your other farm chores. And But we're probably sticking to it. Just It's good for the environment. All, the time, all this just goes in the trash. They appreciate it because all this would just sit in their dumpsters, rotting and smelling. And so it's kind of a win win for them. <clears throat> they got to a point. There, all my stuff gone where they know what like pigs can have and can't have. Like they can't have like the, the orange oranges and onions and certain things. So, there. Well, that's usually all. all right, boys, you gotta move. Bye-bye. Conveniently packed pineapples, for example. All those pineapple rinds that are very healthy to eat go into uh, a, a very measured kind of program for our, our pigs where we control the sugars and carbohydrates and things that are coming out of those uh, waste buckets uh, and making sure there's no mold or food scraps that they're not allowed to eat. Uh, but the pigs really enjoy uh, that, that balanced diet that they're getting. And we're enjoying the fact that that's not going into a food waste or into a, a landfill someplace. Thing that gets us real excited is growing that animal up and, and bringing it to market and creating a great eating experience for our customers. Um, but we also raise these livestock as for conservation purposes and sell them to other farmers. Uh, we engage in conservation breeding. Sunny day, take me down to Culver Lake, take me back to yesterday, cause that's where I belong. So we're a community focused farm and there's a couple things about us that uh, kind of differentiate us from a traditional farm. Some of the other things that we do are more value add. We focus on um, chickens for the purpose of really uh, teaching our homeschool children, uh, but bringing those eggs to market is you know, value add that our customers enjoy. And that's, that's also true of our greenhouse. Uh, funny enough, we started this farm as a commercial aquaponics uh, kind of concept but that sort of changed into really an obsession over pigs and we're really passionate about uh, the animals that we raise. 
Uh, but our greenhouse is productive this year and we're growing for our local markets and we're excited about that. Uh, but by and large, we're a community focused farm. That was a big reason why we got into this. And so that journey has kind of taken us to uh, opening up an on-farm butcher shop, uh, creating partnerships with local farmers where we uh, purchase their cows and process them and really support that local beef market. Same with uh, rabbits and lamb and, and the various talented farmers that, that raise those animals. Uh, and then by kind of taking uh, charge of our process and opening this butcher shop, uh, we're able to kind of create an environment where the community can engage with not just our farm, but all these other locally raised products. Sunny day, take me down to Cove Lake, take me back to yesterday, cause that's where I belong. On a rainy day, take me to that old cafe, we'll watch the teardrops drip away with everything we've known. So we took the journey to open a butcher shop uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, for us, it was out of a little bit of frustration that we would put so much energy and effort into raising a very specific pig, a very specific way, and we wanted a very specific experience for our customers, and the local, uh, or even just kind of the state of support around that doesn't exist for homesteaders and small farmers. Uh, local processors are there to operate a business model that is larger than any of us. and it's kind of not it's not common to have a processor in, in your local area that's going to cut very specific niche things you know off of a pig or produce very niche specific products for you so we recognize that and for us it was either all right this is a hobby and we're just going to grow pigs and have some fun or this is a business and a lifestyle and therefore we need to take control of kind of that that quality of product that we're gonna to deliver to the end customer. And that's the option we went with. Yeah. You're standing in the retail space. Yeah. And we'll have our beer license. I'm just programming these, which was a mess over here. Yeah, no, but we'll have our beer license and our bar um, and our checkout counter over here. And then uh, meat display case, point of sale, coffee bar, and all, and all the merchandise. This is the cover in here, we can walk in the back, but we filled this observation window. So, you know, they can not only see where their food, food comes from, but how it's handled. Yes. There'll be a bar that's here as well. So they can get a, get a beer and sip on it while we cut the meat up. So we opened up a butcher shop having never really cut meat before. I've never been a butcher. I don't have farmers really in my family. Uh, so we might be a little uh, out of our mind for doing this. <clears throat> the worst thing is, is like, I'm really prone to cut myself because it's cold. It's, it's like 36 degrees in here. It's when it's all about the race, no turning back. When the pandemic hit and the overwhelming kind of surge of support around local food happened, it gave us that kind of encouragement and validation that this this was the right this was the right direction to go in, which is which is good. That's that's you know it's good to have the the customers show up and validate the business model. So that's exciting. We became much better farmers when we started actually cutting the animal and breaking it down into retail cuts. Uh, once you can see inside the pig, you kind of know if your assumptions were right from the outside looking in. What we've done with the butcher shop is really kind of taken our product to the next level uh, in a way that there's just, 
I don't see us ever doing with local processors. Um, we hand make all of our sausage. We we do all of our own uh, custom ingredient mixes, and we don't we don't have any chemical inputs in our um, in our spices or any of the ingredients we use in our in our products. And that makes us very excited because now we know that the product that's going out the door is is something that we can look the customers in, in the eye and say this this is the best product we can we're capable of bringing to market. I may be slow to get back up. Folks constantly buy our, you know, new sausage flavors, and and they really kind of gotten into the fact that we're bringing not just our product to market, but other local farmers' product to market. So the the butcher shop has become really a, a centerpiece for uh, the community and the word of mouth and grassroots kind of growth that we've experienced has been just so inspiring. We're very excited about about the product that we're bringing to market uh, and what it's done. To, uh, for us in terms of our knowledge base around farming has been very exciting. Um, we can look at the, the end product of our labor and, and be just very proud of that and excited about that uh, and encouraged to get back out there in the field and keep it going. So this is the classic Christmas hot supper sauce, sweet supper sauce, all from uh, Giacomo's. Uh, this is going to be one of our offerings here. Is if you want to come in and just buy a Jupiter board, get a beer, learn about the farm. But yeah, so taste testing and went to school this afternoon. Well, there's a lot of talented producers in North Carolina and so when we put together our charcuterie board we knew we wanted to source as many of those ingredients from North Carolina uh, producers and so our salamis come from Elon North Carolina and San Giuseppe does a great job with those uh, salamis we, we source crackers from uh, Baker here in North Carolina our jams are from North Carolina um, let's see we've got art here from you know, folks in the community. All of our beef comes from local producers. Um, I think you know, the amount of things that we import are you, you've got to be less than 5% compared to all the other products that we carry. Uh, we even have products that our nonprofit partner creates as a fundraiser and we support those uh, products and push those to, uh, to our charcuterie boards. And we uh, formed a partnership with Honey Tree Farms, which is a market garden, very talented market garden uh, farm here in, in um, Conover, North Carolina, not far at all. And the three of us are uh, working in partnership here on this land to grow a community focused garden that helps uh, support veterans and engage folks to come out and, and really volunteer and be involved in growing that food for the community. You don't have to sing with me, but the truth is written like a sign. I am never heard a no, cause my heart just keeps me out of time. Bless the spirit with the gift to help you when it is to you. You're the music holding me close to everything.
The biggest learning curve for us has been land management. It's, it's uh, things change on pasture and there's a lot of the knowledge out there is locked in older farmers' heads and it's not on Google, it's not even in a book a lot of the times. A lot of the publications out there are all focused around raising them in CAFOs or you know confinement on concrete pads. A lot of the research about nutrition is all based on research in the sort of big agriculture space. And so the resource that I point people most frequently to is their local farmers. Uh, that's where I learned and I'm still learning. I'm, I'm a baby in this business. Five years, six years is not a long time to farm. Uh, it certainly feels like it is from my body's perspective. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's folks out there that I work with that have been doing this 20, 30 years and it's, you know, they're third generation. And those are the folks that we all have to kind of snuggle up close to and learn from. Uh, one of my mentors in the pig space is in upstate New York. Uh, she does an email, she doesn't text. We communicate over fax machines and phone calls, and I've learned a tremendous amount from her. Uh, the Livestock Conservancy is a great resource for folks. Um, registrars are another source that we've pulled from to learn uh, from kind of the, the masters in the space, so to speak, who are managing large herds and, and you know thinking about genetics at the national level. Those are all folks that you know, I, I take notes and listen very uh, attentive to because they they have all the knowledge. It's it's not unfortunately something you can watch on YouTube uh, and, and become sort of a, a master at. We are actually talking about rolling out a whole education platform online to help with that. Uh, one that also is kind of community focused and helps other farmers participate in that. Uh, and we've got plans to add on classes and workshops and those sorts of things to engage folks in kind of the, the aspect of both farming and preparing their food. We've, we've learned how difficult it is not only to manage the land and soil, but to manage multiple business models on that at the same time. And so for us, it's been a, a fun journey kind of learning both not just the agriculture side and the management of that, but sort of the business model side and the management of that. And, and both are hard, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and it's, it's kind of one of those things where we listen to sort of ourselves and where our kind of passions are going, but also our, our customers and community and, and what their expectations are of us. And, and that's, been, that's been very interesting. And, and our customers are not just people buying the meat, but farmers too and they care about the practices that you know obviously we engage in uh, because their animals get their start here and, and they take them from us and raise them their way uh, and so kind of the intersection of all those business models has been you know eye-opening in terms of how just incredibly vast the agricultural world is what goes into growing food for people um, but also kind of just from a business perspective, how to navigate all this in, in a way that's profitable and, and sustainable from a business perspective and a personal health perspective. Uh, the family, you know, they make... I'm, I'm real proud of my family and all the sacrifices that they've made. Uh, because this journey, I mean, it, it comes, it comes with a tall order in terms of demand. Uh, I think that's the sort of thing, you know, from a journey and a learning curve perspective, that that cost, that management of of the family's investment, that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm real proud of my family, and and I think. You know, we, we check in on each other all the time uh, and, and and ask, you know, hey, do we do we still want to do this? Uh, it's, it's every bit as hard as it was yesterday and it will be that hard tomorrow. And every one of them just signs up for it again and again. And, and it's the kind of lifestyle I think um, you choose. Uh, and then it, it sort of it inspires you and keeps you going.
Just trying to make something out of nothing, you know You never wanted silver, gold, or the finer things Just a wife and kids, a home in the American dream Oh, how you gonna step in line? A big windshield or a plane, not a TV screen Don't you need the road to tell you who you really are Find out whether or not a man could ever change his stars Oh 